Gold hitting an all-time high and Red Lobster filing for bankruptcy. We'll have those stories and more for you coming up in Business Matters. Good afternoon and thanks for joining me here today. I'm David Lamb. I'm filling in for Don today. Now, Wall Street was mixed today as investors weighed hawkish statements from the Federal Reserve against evidence of cooling U.S. inflation. The tech-heavy Nasdaq led the pack with a boost from chips, while the blue chip Dow dipped below 40,000. We got some comments from Fed officials today, and it seems they are still cautious of the central bank's progress in reining in inflation. Target has lowered prices on thousands of popular items to attract inflation-weary shoppers. In a statement, Target executive, a Target executive said that it knows that its customers are feeling pressure to make the most of their budget. The big box retailer plans to slash prices on 5,000 frequently shopped products by summertime. This ranges from milk and diapers to butter and laundry detergent. The change affects name brands and house brands. But Target said prices will vary depending on the city. The cuts for Target are an attempt to turn sales around. And after last year's sales fell for the first time since 2016, other major retailers, including IKEA and Aldi, have been reducing prices in recent months to reattract consumers into stores. Microsoft unveiled new AI devices and features at its product event at its, at its Redmond, Washington campus. Chief Executive Satya Nadella introduced what he called Copilot Plus PCs. He said Microsoft has partnered with Dell, Qualcomm, Intel, and Advanced Micro Devices to help build them. Now, during the event, Microsoft showcased a feature called Recall. Now, Recall essentially tracks all activity on a computer, even sites searched in a browser. It can help users find files and other data that they have seen on their PC. And the company also showed off its co-pilot voice assistant. To demonstrate, the assistant was acting as a real-time virtual coach to a Minecraft video game player. Red Lobster filing for bankruptcy. What went wrong at the iconic seafood restaurant? And what do its troubles say about the changing American economy? NTD's Dave Martin has more. This is big. Red Lobster has filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. The iconic American restaurant chain, known for its Caesar salads, Cheddar Bay biscuits, and endless seafood, is trying to sell its business. Someone's going to own this thing, and they're going to, you know, businesses aren't worth a whole lot dead. Um, they're worth a whole lot more alive. It's just a question of, like, what's the profitable core? Bankruptcy expert Thomas Brazil says the restaurant chain will likely continue operating, but with far fewer stores. The new owner may keep the ones that are profitable and sell the rest. He says they're failing partially because of their place in the economy. They found themselves, I think, in no man's land. They're not Chipotle, um, so, so so like high-end, super fast casual. And they're not, you know, like considered incredibly fancy uh, sit-down. Brazil says the survivors are either catering to the rich by being very fancy and expensive or by catering to everyone else by being fast, cheap, and casual. Red Lobster is neither. You're not going to take your wife there on your anniversary unless you want her to be your ex-wife. But it is now competing with fine dining. If you're going to pay $40, $50 a head for a dinner, why would you go to Red Lobster? Why wouldn't you go to someplace a little bit nicer? Analyst VJ Marolia says Red Lobster also made bad business decisions, particularly for offering endless shrimp for only $20. There seems to be a challenge on social media right now where young men and women, or whatever they identify as on any given day, are saying, I ate 31 shrimp. I had five plates of shrimp. I'm going for my own personal record of 51 shrimp. Marulia says this deal was intended to bring people into the stores while losing money itself. But people enjoyed the endless shrimp so much, Red Lobster lost much more money than it anticipated. This is Dave Martin for NTD News. Gold prices have touched a record high, hitting $2,449.89 per ounce in the session. Recent economic data has boosted a 
has boosted chances for interest rate cuts by the U.S. Federal Reserve. U.S. gold futures gained a bit too. Spot silver followed suit and hit an 11-year high. Unlike gold though, silver is considered an industrial commodity since it can be used in products such as solar panels. Now back to precious metals, they went the opposite route and dipped. For more analysis, I talked to Daniel Lacaille earlier. He is the chief economist at the Tresses Hedge Fund, also professor of global economics at Madrid's IE University Business School. Daniel, great to have you with us. Now, gold price hit a record high today. What do you think is behind this rally? The rally in gold prices comes from a number of factors. Number one, there is an increasing level of demand from central banks. We have seen that the Central Bank of China, Russia, India, many central banks are increasing their exposure to gold in order to pump up their reserve base and have it less dependent on the fluctuations of treasuries and bonds, which is usually what they have in the asset base. The second one is that the supply of gold has been significantly weaker than what was initially expected in 2024. Production has been uh, slowing down, and although uh, demand is uh, creeping up, supply is not able to catch up with that uh, as fast as expected. Mm. And the third one is a monetary factor. Many investors are seeing that the Federal Reserve is going to continue to be accommodative. When the Federal Reserve announced that it would slow down its normalization of the balance sheet, it basically meant that it was implementing a hidden quantitative easing. So considering that the deficit spending of the government is not slowing down, investors are seeing that there will be more monetary easing, which means weaker currency, which means, obviously, stronger uh, demand for gold. And it seems that China has been buying a lot of gold lately. What's your thoughts on that? Well, China has more than doubled its uh, gold reserves, and it's now at the highest level of gold reserves to total assets uh, in uh, the last 40 years. And that comes mostly from the need of China to try to diversify the asset base of its balance sheet, of the balance sheet of the central bank, uh, uh, away from U.S. treasuries. As everybody knows, uh, China has a very significant amount of U.S. treasuries in their books. However, those treasuries with uh, perpetuated inflation are coming down in price. They're not uh, increasing the price in the market. And that negative impact is hurting the balance sheet of the Chinese central bank. So China needs to strengthen its position in gold in order to reduce its exposure to US dollars. And it's showing that it needs to purchase a significantly higher amount because if we look at the total percentage of gold relative to the asset base, uh, to the total reserves, it's uh, less than 4.5%. All right, Daniel. So there's also a broader rally in commodities with silver uh, topping $30 last week. Is this going to last? Well, I think that as long as investors are discounting that central banks are going to be significantly more uh, uh, accommodative, they are going to continue to be easing and probably implementing some kind of quantitative easing considering how aggressive fiscal policy is, I think that that is likely to continue to strengthen precious metals. At the end of the day, the best hedge against monetary destruction, against the destruction of the purchasing power of fiat currencies, and against the uh, decision of central banks to monetize government debt is gold and precious metals, probably also Bitcoin, but we also must remember that the volatility in Bitcoin is not acceptable for many investors. All right, and lastly, shifting gears a bit, Congressman Thomas Massey last week brought a bill to abolish the Fed. Do you think that's going too far? Well, I don't think that you need to abolish the Fed. I think that what you basically need to do is to uh, make the Fed accountable for its decisions and follow its mandate. The problem of the Fed is that it doesn't follow its mandate. It has a mandate of stable prices. Stable prices are not what uh, American citizens are seeing and employment. 
employment is okay, but uh, in terms of stability of prices, it's far from uh, accomplishing its mandate. Therefore, abolishing the Fed is is something that is very unlikely to happen. Uh, I think that basically what needs to happen is that the Fed needs to be more independent and it needs to be truly data dependent. They say that they are data dependent, but they're not. And they're not following monetary aggregates. That's why they made a mistake printing way too much money and causing inflation. And now they are making a mistake by keeping rates, but easing on the side of the balance sheet. All right, Daniel, thank you so much for bringing value to our show and uh, talking about this record high in gold pricing. Thank you so much. Always a pleasure. Almost two months after its collision with the Baltimore Bridge, the trapped cargo ship Dolly is finally being removed. The ship will be hauled from the wreckage site and moved two and a half miles to Baltimore's marine terminal. This is a crucial step toward reopening the key port, which could happen by the end of the month. In the early hours of March 26, the Dolly lost power and veered off course, slamming into the bridge and triggering the collapse. Six workers on the bridge were killed. A preliminary investigation from the National Transportation Board found the Dolly had a pair of electrical failures minutes before the collision. It also had two blackouts, one caused by crew error, while it was in port the day before. Meanwhile, Dolly's 21-member crew have been confined to the ship since the crash, and it's unclear what will happen to them once the ship is moved. And Apple launching an aggressive discounting campaign in China, cutting as much as $300 for certain iPhones. What's behind the move? Multiple car makers have bought parts made by a Chinese company sanctioned for using forced labor. This is according to a new Senate inquiry. We have more details on that and more coming up. Stay with us. JP Morgan Chase executives predict that the bank would earn more income from high U.S. interest rates, even in uncertain economic times. The bank has raised its forecast for net interest income to $91 billion. That's the difference between what it makes on loans and pays out on deposits. The forecast also excludes its market division. Budget airline Ryanair has posted its best ever annual profit. Its full year profit after tax soared to more than $2 billion. Higher traffic and increased fares helped offset increased operating costs. The airline has also announced a 700 million euro buyback program, which its CFO says reflects a very strong balance sheet. Shares of digital pharmacy Hims Hers Health have surged. This came after the startup announced it will offer GLP-1 weight loss injections. GLP-1 medications such as Ozempic and Wigovi have skyrocketed in popularity. The company launched a weight loss program in December, but GLP-1 injections were not previously available. Apple. Apple slashed iPhone prices in China today. The tech giant launched an aggressive discounting campaign on its official Tmall site in the country. It offered discounts of up to $318 on select iPhone models. It comes as Apple looks to defend its position in the high-end smartphone market. The company currently faces more competition from local rivals like Huawei. Last month, Huawei introduced its new series of high-end smartphones. Apple's discount offers runs from May 20th to May 28th and is more substantial than the offer in February. The steepest discount applies to the one terabyte iPhone 15 Pro Max model. Other makes have also seen big price cuts. Some automakers have been having trouble properly tracing some of their parts to Chinese forced labor. BMW, Jaguar, and Volkswagen have been cited in a new Senate inquiry. NTD's Sean Marshall has more. German automaker BMW imported at least 8,000 Mini Cooper vehicles into the United States with parts from a banned Chinese supplier. This is according to a new Senate report. The report is done by Senate Finance Committee Chairman Ron Wyden's staff. 
It also says Jaguar and Volkswagen were found to have manufactured and imported vehicles containing parts presumptively made by forced labor. And as ongoing business ties to manufacturing in Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. Here's one example from the report. A California-based auto supplier, Borns Incorporated, had sourced parts from a Chinese firm that's on a restricted list, meaning its products are presumed to be made with forced labor. Borns provided parts to a company that directly supplies to BMW and Jaguar Land Rover. The report did say Jaguar Land Rover quarantined the existing inventory globally for destruction as soon as it learned the issue. BMW Group said in an email it had taken steps to halt the importation of affected products. Senator Wyden says automakers' self-policing is not doing the job. He is calling on Customs and Border Protection to step up enforcement. Congress in 2021 passed the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act. Its goal is to strengthen enforcement to prevent the import of goods from China's Xinjiang region. It's believed that forced labor is being used in the region from members of the country's Uyghur minority group. China denies the allegations. Sean Marshall, NTD News. Investors appear to have little confidence in China's historic measure to stabilize its troubled property sector. As a result, shares for Chinese developers have fallen. Hong Kong's Hang Seng Mainland Properties Index closed down, as well as state-backed developer China Vanke. Same for Ximao Group, RNF Properties, Kaisa Group, and KWG Group. China has announced waves of failed policies for years to try to lift its property market. In its latest attempt, China said it would facilitate up to $138 billion in funding to clear some property inventory. Analysts say the size of the financing offer pales in comparison to the size of housing inventory across the country, which could be worth as much as trillions of Chinese yuan. Millennials have come up with creative ways to own a home, and this is according to a new report released by Bankrate.com. Earlier, Don spoke with Alex Gailey from Bankrate for more details on this. So Alex, appreciate you coming on the show today. Uh, I have some questions for you in regards to this new report by Bankrate on how home, uh, home buyers and their behavior when it comes to purchasing new homes. Uh, tell us what you found in, in, this, uh, in this report. Our survey at Bankrate found that there's been a shift in how generations are purchasing their homes. So overall, what we find is differences across generations. Millennials are more likely to have purchased a home alone, and they're also more likely to have purchased a home with a friend or with a relative other than a domestic partner or spouse. And just to level set here, buying a home with a domestic partner or a spouse is still the most common way to buy a home across all generations, but you're just seeing a higher percentage of millennials buying homes in other ways such as by themselves with a friend or with a relative and then you see baby boomers and gen xers have primarily purchased homes with domestic partners or spouses so the difference here is that uh, millennials compared to older generations are more likely to buy themselves why is that it's likely due to a shift in generational norms around marriage. So younger Americans are likely to marry later in life or just decide to stay single altogether. And so that is likely impacting the type of homes that younger generations are looking for as well as whether they purchase by themselves or with another person. And it's interesting too, because you do see a higher percentage of millennials have purchased a home with a friend or with a relative other than a domestic partner spouse. The statistics there are roughly 10% and 7%. So overall, buying with a friend or with a relative other than a spouse is still not very common, but you do see millennials do that at a higher rate than Gen Xers and baby boomers where the percents are less than five there. So it's interesting to sort of see those shifts there. And I do suspect these trends to continue if we continue seeing a rising share of single Americans and if home affordability does and improve in the next few years substantially. Speaking of home affordability, how, how does, has that impacted how people buy homes? 
So we know that right now home affordability is the main obstacle for aspiring homeowners. Home prices are high, mortgage rates are high. There's also low inventory across the U.S. when it comes to housing. So it's a challenging market overall and has been for the last year. Um, and that is impacting how younger generations approach home ownership because it's a lot easier to afford a home if you can split those costs with another person, whether it is a romantic partner or a friend or even a relative such as a sibling, a sister or a brother, you're going to have an easier time as a first time home buyer, you know, splitting the down payment, splitting the closing costs, splitting that mortgage payment on a regular basis than if you were to do that completely by yourself. And so I do think these co-ownership statistics that I've talked about with a friend or with a relative are a little bit more tied to affordability because the key reason to purchase with another person if you don't have a romantic partner is does come down to the fact that it is more affordable to own a home that way all right pretty much sums it up uh, anything else you like to mention that we didn't cover here i can just add that uh, some data at Bankrate shows that we, we have a lot of surveys on home affordability and how people are making sacrifices to buy homes. And you do generally see that younger generations are more willing to make sacrifices to find affordable housing. So 76% of millennials are willing to take steps to find affordable housing. That is higher than Gen Xers and baby boomers. And that's likely because a larger pool of millennials are first time home buyers compared to Gen Xers and baby boomers are more likely to be repeat home buyers. But nonetheless, you do see that generally they're willing to make more sacrifices to become homeowners. They're willing to take on side hustles. They're willing to move back in with mom and dad. They're willing to take out of their retirement savings just so that they can become homeowners because homeownership is still a key part of the American dream for most millennials. All right. Very well said here, Alex. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you so much. All right. That's all the stories we have for you today. Thank you very much for watching. And if you have any feedback for the episode, feel free to let us know. You can email us at business at ntd.com or leave a comment online. We read them all. And don't forget, business matters. Goodbye.